In the spring of 1941, as the Battle of Britain was being fought out in the skies high above the south of England, down in the seedy streets of Soho in London's West End, another battle was raging. Rival gangs with names such as the Italian Mob, the Hoxton Gang and the St Pancras Boys all fought for control of the Spielers and lucrative gaming clubs. The haunt of the Italian Mob was the Perm Beach Bottle Party, a small club at 37 Wardour Street. It was managed by Antonio Mancini and his assistant Albert Dimes and they looked after both the Perm Beach in the basement and the West End Bridge and Billiards Club which occupied two of the upper floors. It was on the doorstep of this club on the 20th of April 1941 that a disturbance broke out between members of the Hoxton Gang and the doorman at the club, Pat Crowley. Hoxton Gang member Edward Teddy Fletcher was identified and promptly barred from the premises. As he walked away, he made threats against Mancini. Antonio Mancini was a 39-year-old Italian whose parents had come to England in 1870 and settled in Clerkenwell, at the time the heart of the Italian community in central London. Known to his friends as Babe or Babyface, Mancini laughed off the threats. He was a well-known underworld tough with a criminal record for assault, theft and dishonesty dating back many years and was as much in demand for his skills with a razor and his fist as for his managerial skills. Being used to being threatened from both expelled rowdy drunks and rival gang members, he often carried a knife for his own protection. On Wednesday evening, the 31st of April, 11 days after being barred, Teddy Fletcher and several of his friends returned to 37 Wardour Street. They took the stairs to the billiard club at the top floor, where a scuffle soon broke out. Fletcher and 36-year-old Harry Distelman were thrown out of the club by two of Mancini's doormen with Fletcher receiving a head wound that needed two stitches in the nearby Charing Cross Hospital. In the early hours of the following morning, the men returned and there was another disturbance. Hearing that a fight was taking place, Mancini, his assistant manager, 26-year-old Albert Dimes, and another Italian, 32-year-old Joseph Coletti, rushed upstairs where they discovered several of the Hoxton gang trading punches with the Italians. No sooner had they entered the room than someone shouted, there's babe, let's knife him. Mancini was confronted by Fletcher and Distelman in the middle of the brawl, with billiard cues, chairs, knives and broken bottles all being used as weapons. Mancini slashed at Fletcher with a knife, inflicting a severe wound which almost severed his left arm. Then lashing out wildly, he stabbed Distelman under his left armpit. Distelman reeled around as if drunk, crying out, I'm stabbed, babe's done it, as he stumbled downstairs. Someone called for a cab to take him to the hospital, but he died in the club doorway moments later. Like Mancini, Distelman was also a well-known gangland figure. His brother was a police informer and in his pocket was a large roll of cash, three wartime identity cards plus a billiard ball wrapped in a handkerchief. He was also known to habitually carry a knife and beside his body was a small pocket knife, later found not to be the murder weapon but believed to belong to the victim. It was never discovered who placed it beside his body or whether he had even been carrying it during the brawl. The police arrived and as Fletcher was taken to hospital, Mancini was taken into custody, where he made a statement to the police claiming he had acted in self-defence. Described as a catering manager, Mancini appeared at Bow Street Magistrates Court, where he was remanded in custody pending trial. Antonio Mancini appeared at the Old Bailey on Wednesday the 2nd of July before Mr Justice McNaughton. The trial was to last three days. The Attorney General Sir Donald Somerville KC along with George McClure KC and Christmas Humphreys prosecuted. Mancini was defended by Mr Hector Hughes and Mr F D Levy KCs. He pleaded not guilty. Although Mancini had earlier told the police he had acted in self-defence, he now claimed to be completely innocent and had no idea how Distelman had been killed. He said that he had struck out wildly during the fierce brawl and had not known whom he had struck, although he did recall Distelman striking him with a chair and Mancini hitting him on the shoulder. Scotland Yard detectives leading the murder investigation, Detective Chief Superintendent John Sands and Divisional Detective Inspector Arthur Thorpe, testified that Mancini had admitted attacking Fletcher, claiming that the weapon he used had been picked off the floor. In a statement, he later admitted carrying a knife following the April incident. In a summing up later described as too favourable to the accused, the judge explained the laws on murder and self-defence and indeed manslaughter on the grounds of provocation. The jury needed just 54 minutes to find Mancini guilty of murder. There was no recommendation to mercy. 
Mancini appealed against the sentence and it was heard on Wednesday the 20th of August. Appeal judges, Lord Chief Justice, Vice Count Caldicott and Justices Hawkes and Humphreys could not agree on a verdict as it was not clear to the court the evidence on whether Distelman had a knife or not. At the trial, Mr McClure had conceded that if Distelman had used a knife, then a verdict of murder would have been difficult to sustain. The emphasis was on the word use, but he added there was no evidence to show Distelman did use a knife and the mystery of how it came to be found beside his body remained. On Tuesday the 3rd of September, there was a second sitting of the Court of Appeal. The original three judges were now joined by Mr Justice Hilbury and Mr Justice Tucker. Mr Hughes, handling Mancini's defence, said much of the evidence and summing up by the trial judge had been confusing, but he did concede that the trial had been favourable to Mancini. Viscount Caldicott said, in law, the issues had been laid before the jury and they had decided Mancini was guilty of murder. The appeal was therefore dismissed. However, having reviewed the case, the Attorney General now decided it should be heard by the House of Lords. It was heard over two days at the beginning of October. In discussing the case, the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, was told by the Lord Chancellor that he had no doubt the crime was murder, with the view taken that Mancini appeared to be the only one who actually used a knife in the brawl. Sir Alexander Maxwell, the Chief Advisor to the Home Secretary, took the view that, leading it towards a man who carried a formidable dagger and with it enters a fight and kills an opponent, would be misplaced. It must be made clear to ruffians of a similar type that the punishment for a crime committed in such circumstances is death. Dismissing this appeal, the Lord Chancellor, Viscount Simon, stated that the House of Lords took the view the jury were fully aware of the legal guidance from the judge being offered the alternative of manslaughter when they found Mancini guilty of murder. Friday the 31st of October 1941 at Pentonville Prison was now set as the date for Mancini's execution and the country's chief executioner, Tom Pierpoint, was offered the engagement with his nephew Albert to act as his assistant. When Tom notified the Home Office he was unavailable, the execution would normally have been offered to the other senior hangman on the list, Stanley Cross. However, Cross had officiated at three executions in the previous year at Pentonville and in all cases it was noted on the official LPC4 form that he seemed to have difficulty working out the drops and was therefore not suitable to be trusted with the responsibilities of a chief executioner. The offer was then made to Albert Pierpont. This was the second time Albert had been entrusted in carrying out an execution and by an amazing coincidence the person he was scheduled to hang on the previous occasion had also taken his case to the House of Lords. In 1935, 21-year-old Reginald Wilmington was successful at his appeal. Mancini was not so lucky. On Thursday afternoon, the 30th of October, Albert arrived at Pentonville, where he met his assistant, Steve Wade. After reporting to the governor, they were escorted to the execution chamber, where the long wooden box containing all the equipment was opened. Albert took out the two ropes, one old and one brand new, and examined each one meticulously, from the top where the rope is shackled to the chain, then inch by inch along the whole of the 10 foot length, paying particular attention to the noose part where the leather clad rope passes through the brass eyelet woven into the hemp. By habit, most hangmen chose the older rope. There was less stretch in it and it made it easier to achieve an accurate drop. They then fastened a sandbag filled to the same weight as the prisoner onto the noose and in the presence of Governor Ball and the Chief Engineer, Albert carried out a test drop. Mancini was observed through the spy hole and Pierpoint noted he was handsome and seemed composed as he chatted to the warders who had watched him night and day since he entered the condemned cell. At 6.30 on the following morning, the hangmen were woken and made their way to the gallows. They removed the sandbag from the noose and Wade detached the trapdoors from the rubber clad springs and standing on a stool, pushed them up flat. Pierpoint slid the bolt into the lever that secured them in place, then positioned the cotter pin, a security device that prevented the lever being pushed accidentally. He took a tape measure and adjusted the drop to the new calculation. The rope lay on the closed trapdoors. Pierpoint picked it up, coiled it so the noose hung at head height and as he held it in place, Wade secured it with a piece of pack thread. They then re the T on the trapdoors where Mancini's toes would be aligned to with the arches of his feet across the gap between the trapdoors. With everything now ready, they made an official record of the drop and returned to their cells to wait. <music> 
At a few minutes to nine, they assembled outside the cell door. The governor stood with a stopwatch in hand, and as the minute hand reached the hour, he raised a finger to signal to begin. The chief warder silently opened the cell door, and Pierpont entered with the wrist strap in his right hand. Wade followed a pace behind. Dressed in a smart suit, Mancini was standing facing the door, and he smiled as Hangman approached. After strapping his wrist, Pierpont told the prisoner to follow me, and stepped through the side door in the cell wall that had silently opened after the hangman had entered. Seven paces took them onto the drop. Pierpont turned to face the prisoner, stopped him on the chalk mark, and as Wade strapped his ankles, he pulled a white hood from his breast pocket and planed it over Mancini's head. Cheerio, the prisoner said, as a noose was placed around his neck. At the Old Bailey on the 21st of July, as Mancini lay in the condemned cell waiting for his first appeal, assistant manager Albert Dimes and Italian Joseph Coletti were charged with the attempted murder of Edward Fletcher. Both were found guilty of unlawful wounding by the judge, recorded Sir Gerald Dobson, who told the jury there was no evidence to show they did anything more than engage in a rough and tumble, and both were bound over to keep the peace for three years. The carrying out of the death sentence initially impacted on West End gangland violence, with the truce being agreed. However, as the war continued and Antonio Mancini soon became forgotten, whole hostilities were renewed and the underworld returned to its dark and dangerous ways. With his boss awaiting execution, assistant manager Albert Dimes took over the running of the Wardour Street Club and would later go on to become a well-known underworld figure with connections to Craterin's rivals, the Richardsons. He died in 1972. Albert Pierpoint continued as the chief executioner for another 14 years until he resigned in February 1956. He handled a total of 433 men and women. Following Pierpoint's resignation, there were no executions in 1956, as Parliament debated the death penalty again, following a series of high-profile cases like Timothy Evans, Derek Bentley and Ruth Ellis, which had seen a general sway towards abolition. The outcome of this was a bill named the Homicide Act, which limited the number of offences now carrying the death penalty to just a handful. Questions were also asked to the Home Secretary about allegations and affidavit made by Mancini's solicitor that the Crown made a private offer to the Defence Council back in 1941 to reduce the charge to one of manslaughter and not murder. And it was asked why this was not acted upon and the death sentence commuted. Nothing came of this and it was soon forgotten. In July that year, Chief Superintendent Arthur Thorpe, who had been a divisional detective inspector during the war and had arrested Mancini, died in hospital at the age of 55 two years after retiring as head of the fraud squad. A pub still occupies the building at 37 Wardour Street, now part of Chinatown, and drinkers passing the spot where Harry Dusterman died that May morning in 1941 are doubtless unaware that his death and the Halloween execution that followed heralded the beginning of the reign of the 20th century's most well-known executioner. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Hangman's Record, and also my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find out more about my books and also order copies of The Hangman's Record at a special subscriber price. Also follow me on Facebook on my Hangman's Record page where we can discuss this and other episodes in the series.